It's been quite the wait for more info on the sequel to Breath of the Wild. Nintendo has stayed tight-lipped on the game with barely a hint of information coming out. But that's finally changed with the release of this E3's gameplay trailer. It's only a minute's worth of footage, but that minute is packed with hints, clues, and lore that fans will be picking apart for months to come. I don't know what others have found or the theories they put forth, these are simply my own observations and the connections I made with what was shown and it's fascinating to say the least. So let's not waste any more time and take a deep dive into the newly revealed gameplay. The substance known as Malice is more prevalent than anything else in this trailer and serves as a signifier of Ganon. It can be taken as the literal curse of demise as all of Ganon's hate, rage, and desire corrupts anything it touches and even consumes himself. It would explain why his body is little more than a withered husk. But the threat of Ganon is not gone as small tendrils of malice grow and grow in this prologue until they completely fill the screen. This is a marked difference from the malice in Breath of the Wild, which was more passive. It acted as more of a poisonous swamp that could also spawn enemies, but this is actively malevolent as these scenes are interspersed with what happens to Link, Zelda, and Ganondorf's husk. But first, this trailer is tied to the events of the reveal trailer, showing the outcome of many of the scenes interspersed there. Even the openings are parallel as the first trailer shows the mysterious green energy, while the second features the aforementioned malice. So with that in mind, I want to break this down and add some of my own conjecture in order to hopefully provide a better idea of just what leads into Link's new adventure. During their efforts to rebuild Hyrule, Link and Zelda discover catacombs deep beneath the castle and decide to investigate. As they explore, symbols and history are laid out as evidenced by the picture of Ganondorf wielding a trident. Intrigued on what it all means and likely concerned by the flowing malice, Zelda insists on discovering the source. It's then that they find Ganondorf's withered body, which features the malice flowing from it, as well as an ethereal green hand apparently serving as a seal. But seals in the Zelda series tend to weaken, and this is no different. Something causes Ganondorf's husk to awaken, likely the presence of Link and Zelda, and at that moment, all hell breaks loose. An earthquake shakes the foundation, causing the floor to give way and Zelda to fall. Link's hand is shown reaching for Zelda's as they nearly grip one another, but something causes Link to fail as the new trailer shows Zelda falling into a chasm. It seems Link was about to fall as well, but the arm sealing Ganon reaches out and saves Link. But this is small comfort as Ganondorf soon awakens and his malice begins to spread uncontrollably, first straight upward, then outward, even reaching Link as the new trailer flashes. There, it shows that the malice not only overtakes Link's entire right arm, but even the Master Sword, which almost certainly explains why it's not shown for the rest of the trailer. It's possible that the malice has corrupted it entirely and it needs to be purified if Link hopes to wield it again. The substance then flares wide at the top of Link's shoulder, looking to take over his entire body by the look of it. But somehow, the arm saves him again as it grafts itself onto Link. What that meant was never really known until this new trailer, as it shows the ceiling arm grafted on top of Link's with the same green energy and bindings. Even Link's fingernails are different as they become long and sharp, giving a more bestial aura. It gives the sense that this power has outright replaced Link's arm, as it featured those same long fingernails when it saved him. The last of what I can presume is part of this opening is Ganondorf's husk standing and raising his arms. I believe this is done to spread his malice even further, but something happens that causes Hyrule Castle to lift into the sky. It's unclear if this is due to Ganondorf or some more helpful force though, as malice begins pouring out from where it was, almost as if the castle was acting as a kind of cork. The big question is if this is the castle protecting itself, or if Ganondorf himself raised the castle in order to maintain control. There are still a lot of unanswered questions to all of this though. What happened to Zelda? How does Link escape the malice that spouts out beneath the castle? Is his natural arm unusable without the ceiling arm attached? Could the malice that overtook him be a form of possession from Ganondorf? It would be quite the twist if Link's companion this time around was Ganondorf, constantly in his ear, though I highly doubt that's the case. We've been given context, but not enough to figure out all the answers, especially the big one. How and why does Link find himself in the skies above Hyrule? The transition from the dark, ominous, and dangerous underground to the bright, open, and freeing skies is utterly breathtaking though. It gives the same sense of openness and wonder as the original Breath of the Wild with new possibilities on the horizon. Link free falls through the clouds, but there is a destination ahead. 
A small floating island awaits below, which is dotted with trees all along its edge. Strangely, the center is difficult to make out, which could mean it's simply a large lake. The island is in complete wilderness though as the camera pans to reveal a paved road. It leads from one island to the next despite the gaps in between, making it seem as if all of these islands used to be one cohesive whole. The roads also indicate that a society lived or still inhabit these floating islands. I'm not sure which it could be as no person is ever seen and many of the structures seem to be in ruins, but that could be an effect of the islands splitting apart and not the ravages of time. This scene also serves as a good look at Link's body in the aftermath of his encounter with the Malice. When his arm isn't glowing, it seems to be a dull blue while the bindings look almost like armor. More curious is the pattern on his side and shoulder, which was seen covered in the Malice. Are these simply patterned scars from the encounter, or is this some kind of curse? Personally, I'm leaning toward the latter as those markings feel too purposeful, but it is amusing that Breath of the Wild is once again bringing Princess Mononoke to mind as that was a common point of comparison before the original came out. Here, Link could be suffering a curse in the same vein as Ashitaka, though what would the curse actually do? Is it negated by his new arm, or could it randomly pop up in gameplay in a manner similar to Ashitaka? Moving on from those questions, Link has also come into possession of some new clothes since the events of the opening. He's now wearing Greek-inspired sandals in the same vein as Pit, a green half-shirt, and a tunic over his shorts. His hair is flowing wildly in the wind as he no longer has his ponytail. Interestingly, it is there later in the trailer, but only during the scenes where he's on the surface. Is it more of a costume thing, or is there some significance to the state of his hair? Either way, one other new costume is shown in the next scene, where Link uses the paraglider. The paraglider is mostly the same as before, except for the twin streamers trailing behind. Link himself has seen a few additions, as he now has a pair of boots and pants to go along with the shirt, plus a bow and arrow and shield to defend himself. But that shield is completely new and features a symbol that, to my recollection, has never been shown before. It's reminiscent of the Sheikah symbol thanks to the eye, but there's no tear. Instead, it spreads wide and almost comes across as a waterfall while two rows of triangles are underneath. It's damaged as well with a pretty significant crack at the upper edge. It's not the only time this symbol is seen either as it's displayed on the new creature that's presumably an enemy. Not only does its own eye and upper body look like the symbol, but the earring like adornments hanging on its side are shaped like it as well. Could all this mean the Sky Islands are or were inhabited by an offshoot of the Sheikah, or is this a completely new group of people? And what is up with this golem anyway? The rocks on its shoulders are likely made from the same material as the floating islands, allowing it to fly in the way it does, while the bottom half features hands that bring to mind the Wind Waker's Godon or Ocarina of Time's Bongo Bongo. But none of this is as confusing as the symbol on the creature's chest. It's a broom of all things, placed in the center of a yellow circle with a small gap at the bottom, while the familiar green markings of the ceiling arm surround that. So why a broom? Is this some kind of maintenance bot gone awry, or does some ability of Link's involve a broom? Both of those seem patently silly, considering the more serious tone of the trailer, but Zelda's no stranger to joking around. I really believe this means something that I just can't grasp yet, but this also indicates that this golem is man-made. That must mean that the people behind this new symbol found a way to harness the green energy as it's being used to connect the two halves of the creature. Link learning to control it is likely how he'll gain new abilities, which we do see elsewhere in the trailer. Returning to Link paragliding amongst the clouds, another look is provided at the floating islands, this time from the side. The islands are not all at the same level either, as some are far above the others. This is made obvious on the upper left, which seems to be mostly made up of forest other than the small offshoot next to it. There, ruins can be spotted, providing more evidence of this sky civilization. It's not the only time in the trailer either, as there are a few scenes that feature them. Even the golem scene has one to the right, the closest look provided, but other than a strange symbol carved into the corner, there's not a lot to say. I'm more interested in the center island as that features what could be walls or rock formations along with the typical trees. But if they are walls, and some do have a curve to them, could that mean this island has a village on it? Some of the trees even look like straw-thatched houses, though it's entirely possible I'm fooling myself due to the low quality of zooming in. 
but a town serving as a kind of base where Link can learn more about the environment makes sense here as the right side is completely engulfed by a massive structure that could be seen as some kind of fortress. The design is close to those of the ruins, but this looks fully functional. Here's the thing though. If this is a fortress, then this might be the best clue yet that this sequel brings back classic dungeons to the new formula. It's certainly more imposing than the shrines, and seems closer in design to the Divine Beasts, which were a kind of dungeon for Breath of the Wild. What's amazing though is how everything still feels so vertical despite Link running around in the sky. The colors have a different feel to the surface, and there's even a sense of wonder as indicated by the huge arch that can be spotted in the distance. This does lead me to ask a question though. How does Link actually reach these islands? He's using the paraglider, but there's no way he has enough stamina to reach that island, and I feel he'd be too low if he was somehow able to reach it. There must be some other method of sky traversal that hasn't been shown yet, which would explain how he got so high in the air to do a free fall, and how he might be able to reach the islands. It's possible the trailer has already shown the method too. There's a scene that plays where a splash plays out in reverse. The water consolidates from a puddle and lifts into the air. It's quite like the reverse of the drops that fell upon the Sheikah Slate, upgrading it. But what does it indicate here? Well, I believe this is how Link travels from the surface to the Sky Islands. It feels connected to the scene afterward where Link dives straight into rock while surrounded by twirling green energy. Rather than bash his head, he slips through the stone and emerges on the other side. And what does the energy look like when he's doing this? Like he's going into and out of water. It wouldn't surprise me in the slightest if these special pools of water were how Link travels to the sky. That doesn't exactly explain how he gets from island to island though. Perhaps other pools will serve a similar purpose, but that doesn't explain why Link would then need to use his paraglider. Something else is happening instead. Perhaps Loftwings will return, but why would Link need his paraglider then? It's a mystery that doesn't have an answer quite yet. Before moving on, I do want to talk about where Link appeared when he used the puddle. There's another ruin nearby with indistinct patterns carved into the stone, while the rocks that featured on the top of the golem seem to act like lanterns on the pedestals here. Maybe this is a replacement for shrines and will allow for quick travel once completed like those. I also have a guess as to where this takes place in Hyrule thanks to the giant mushroom-like formations on the surface. These resemble the same type of tree that was found in both Ludfoe's Bog and Ceres Scablands, though I think this location is the latter as there's little water compared to the bog. It does beg the question of how much of Hyrule is explorable this time around. Is it the same map? Does it have to be re-explored to open up fast travel? There are no Sheikah Towers in the distance, so at the very least, it seems like a new form of travel is necessary. But again, I'm left unsure of what that travel could be. That's all of the scenes that take place in the sky, as the rest feature Link running around the surface of Hyrule. The first features Link in his traditional clothes from Breath of the Wild, though with the armored adornments that were seen in the first trailer. He's also using the Traveler's Shield. But why the change of clothes? It fits the other trailer, but up until this point, I believe that the game began with Link and Zelda underground. Even taking a closer look at his right arm, it's hard to determine if this takes place after the scene with Ganondorf's husk, or before, as a kind of warm-up reintroducing players to what Link can do. If that is the case, it's a heck of a trial as it features a trio of Bokoblins who have set up a fort on top of a talus. It's such a clever combination of enemies that it feels like it should have always been there. It's even possible to spot the Talus' weak spot, though I'm much more intrigued by the Bokoblin's redesign. The horn on their head has grown significantly, equivalent to the length of a Moblin. But why? Has the defeat of Calamity Ganon allowed them to escape stagnation as evidenced by their resurrections from the Blood Moon? Are they a new variation of Bokoblin? Or did Nintendo simply want to change up their look for the sequel? It really could be any. Another mystery comes from Link's use of stasis upon a mountain, which has seemingly seen a major upgrade. Rather than chains bringing the rolling spike to a standstill, the yellow light surrounds it before all the color is drained from the world, save for the projection of where it will be reflected back. But that projection appears even before the color is drained away, which is an important detail. It indicates that this ball can't be manipulated in the same way as an object in stasis in Breath of the Wild. So really, this might not be stasis at all. A more apt turn may be reflect or reverse. But if that is the case, can it only be applied to objects and not enemies? Presumably, based on this one example, momentum needs to be behind the object in order to reflect it, so it could be possible that Link can also send arrows back to the ones who fired it. 
It's all conjecture, but it does make this power more exciting than just the return of stasis. That said, another reason this is likely not stasis is because Link doesn't use the Sheikah Slate. In fact, neither Link nor Zelda have the slate on their person in either trailer. It's just not there. So where's this power come from? Naturally, his new arm. As he uses the power, a bright yellow light emanates from his hand before dissipating. There are moments where it looks like a triangle, but I don't believe this has anything to do with the Triforce. Instead, it could hint that the arm can be upgraded. Maybe it's gradually over time if dungeons have returned, or it could be relatively quickly like the Sheikah Slate in Breath of the Wild. But this is absolutely Link's new hand, as can be seen once the light disappears. What left me curious though is the circle at the back, something that I didn't take notice of when shown the arm in close-up. Could there be a recession there which glows differently depending on the power used or equipped? That doesn't seem to be the case in the close-up, but that circle is where the light originates from, so there has to be some importance. What isn't connected to his right arm is the new flamethrower weapon. That's actually connected to Link's left arm and takes the shape of a dragon head, fitting considering all the fire. It's a cool weapon to be sure, but it may be one of many and hint to the flexibility Link may have in battle now. It's possible that Link could mix and match his weaponry in both hands. No longer would his left hand be limited to shields, but other devices such as this. All the player would have to do is hold down the shield button to send out the flames. Theoretically, Link should be able to use his sword in conjunction with the flamethrower, as there is one strapped to his back, but this scene seems more focused on showing off the new weapon. Still, if I am right about this, it could lead to a lot of fun combinations and possibilities. The enemy he's fighting is a completely new plant monster with its central ball serving as an obvious weak point. That doesn't matter too much when facing a flamethrower, but it's good to know when Link doesn't have one of those. There's not much to say about the plant itself at first glance. It's more a matter of where this is taking place. Is this a cave on the surface or in the sky? If it is on the surface, could there be a series of caves to explore in order to find Zelda? That would expand the scope of Hyrule to an incredible degree if there was an entire sky and underground to explore, but it's merely a theory at this point. Another important question for this fight is why it's happening at all. There's nothing behind it, no path to take or treasure to find. It's a dead end. It seems pointless. But maybe the plant is the point, and this is something that Link is searching for specifically. After all, with it being underground, this may be more of a route. Maybe Link has to travel underground in order to locate all of these root points and clear the way forward from some kind of corrupted tree. It's my best guess as to why Link is fighting it. The fight also ties into something you've likely noticed during this trailer. After Link is attacked by the Malice, his face is never fully shown again. The only peek at it actually happens during the fight with the plant as he backflips away. It's there that the left side of his face can be seen, and it's totally normal. But that hasn't stopped speculation that Link's face may have been corrupted in some way from the malice. I'm unsure myself whether Link's face would be scarred, but I don't think it's being purposefully hidden. After all, this is a gameplay trailer, and typically the player only sees Link's back. That's the case in this trailer, while also providing a cinematic angle. Nintendo is more concerned with the audience seeing the new enemies and gameplay than Link himself. Of course, if he has been scarred or his eye infected with malice, it would lend further credence to my theory that Ganondorf will act as a kind of twisted companion to him. I think the idea has merit, as it'd be a way to get Ganondorf's perspective on many things. Maybe it would give the opportunity for him to recount his past, explain how he became Calamity Ganon, give him the character development that he has lacked since the Wind Waker. It feels more important than ever because if the Malice is a manifestation of Ganondorf's corruption, then it's also representative of Demise's curse. And if that's the case, then this has the potential to be the end of another Zelda timeline where Ganondorf was fully defeated. It happened in both the Fallen Hero and Wind Waker branches, this would end the Twilight Princess offshoot. And it would be especially fitting considering the re-release of Skyward Sword, which is the beginning of the Zelda timeline. Again though, this is mostly wishful thinking and fan speculation. What Nintendo actually plans to do is a mystery, as there's just too little that has been revealed and so many questions left unanswered. Why did Hyrule Castle rise into the air? What role will Zelda play besides being trapped underground? Why did this arm graft onto Link? What happened to the Master Sword? Who are the people that lived in the sky? What role does the surface of Hyrule play? 
Is Link's face being intentionally hidden? What other powers does Link's new arm have? Are traditional dungeons back, and if they are, what purpose do they serve? Will they power up Link's arm? Will he obtain pieces of the Triforce? Is it a method of reaching Hyrule Castle? There's just so much to discover, and hopefully the story will answer most of these and not relegate the majority of the story to flashbacks with little forward momentum. The gameplay already seems like an expansion of what Breath of the Wild offered. It's possible that the story could follow suit. But what are your Breath of the Wild 2 theories? Do you think any of mine could be on the right track? Let me know in the comments, and if you enjoyed this deep dive into the gameplay reveal trailer, please consider supporting us on Patreon at patreon.com slash gvgaming so we can create more videos like this in the future. Of course, we appreciate all your support, whether it's just hitting the like button, subscribing to Good Vibes Gaming, or ringing the bell. Until next time, bye!